Welcome to Mormon Land, where we explore news in and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm senior religion reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Joining me as senior managing editor David Noyce, who oversees our faith coverage. Hi, Dave. Hello, Peggy. Before we start, we remind you about another way to support Mormon Land. Just go to patreon.com, where with a donation as small as $3 a month, you can access transcripts to our podcasts, our complete newsletter, and all of our religion coverage. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon Land. And if you haven't already, follow us on Instagram at Mormon dot land. Now for today's episode. More than three fourths of Latter-day Saints say they revere nature and feel a responsibility to protect it. Classes on Earth stewardship at church-owned Brigham Young University are filling up as young members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints wrestle with the dangers caused by climate change and feel inexorably prompted to act, to do something. What if the church went all in on protecting the planet, proposing concrete plans to be adopted in every region? Would being involved in an urgent global effort, much as the food storage mandates prepared members for lean times, give more young people a reason to stay in the fold? Ben Abbott, professor of ecology at BYU, joins us in studio to discuss environmental issues his faith, and the activism and idealism he sees in his students. Professor Abbott, welcome. Hi, Peggy. Thank you. Okay, first tell us your own origin story. How did you get interested in environmental issues? You know, I think that I started with uh, nature TV. You know, I watched a lot of TV as a kid, and I just loved National Geographic and Nova and all, all of the shows. Loved animals and really felt this connection Um in, in interest and curiosity, but also a responsibility toward other life on earth, right? As I realized, I learned from these programs, how human activities have, have real impacts on other life. And then it wasn't until I was really a professional scientist that I realized how direct the other connection is, right? When we degrade nature and we harm our home, it immediately and profoundly affects individual to communal well-being. Right? There's no separation between society and nature. In fact, we, we live in the Anthropocene, which is the, the time of the Earth's history that's dominated by people. Right? Mm-hmm. So we are the most important part of nature and understanding how people's values, how their relationships with the world around them are being formed is really crucial. So it yeah, started from with kind of a childish uh, obsession and interest and then ev- evolved into, I think this is the most important humanitarian issue that we can face individually as a church, as a state, as a country, uh, and as a global community. So what, what did you study in college? And I studied watershed science like everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got at, a, at BYU? No, I went to Utah State University and, uh, um, yeah, I got a, a scholarship. It was the the Quinney family, you know, sponsors the College of Natural Resources there. And so got a natural resources scholarship and had a friend who encouraged me to go into the watershed science program. And so I learned a lot of hydrology and biogeochemistry and um, very different. I didn't see many animals uh, except for in like a specimen prep class where we would stuff <laughs> birds that had gotten hit on the highway and <laughs> <laughs> learn things there. But, but, it, but again, it was kind of looking at the system as a whole. How is the whole watershed working? And that really, um, you, 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 you realize that things that you can't see matter most usually. Often things that are really far away are influencing things that are really near and learned the first law of ecology, which is everything is connected to everything else. So how, how does this work, this work on nature and the environment connect to your faith? You know, um, I sometimes talk with my students at BYU, since we are a religious institution, you know, we, in, we integrate our religious beliefs along with whatever content we're teaching. Um, and I teach a climate change course and a, an ecology course. And I often talk with my students and I ask them a question. I say, when Jesus was asked, what's going to be on the test? How did he respond? <laughs> you know, like, what, what are the most important takeaways? And um, he gave a really interesting response, right? When he was asked, what's the most important part of the gospel or commandment in the law? He said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Everything else flows from that. <laughs> and as I think about those two 
bedrock commandments, what we call the two great commandments. How can we love God if we are destroying his creation? Paul Cox, another uh, LDS environmentalist, has said, how can you love um, the, the creator if, or, or the painter if you're um, destroying their painting? Right. Like it's absolutely antithetical. So to honor God, we have to recognize that we are not owners of this earth. We don't we are not entitled. Take what we want. This is everything belongs to God. Right. So th- that's the first answer. And Dave, mm-hmm. yeah, the the this, the second um, the second idea is um, how do we love our neighbor? And actually, one of my close friends and colleagues, uh, Brigham Daniel, says, how can we love our neighbor if we don't love their lungs? <laughs> you know, for polluting the air <laughs> and harming them. Um, there are 15 million premature deaths each year from environmental pollution. This is at a global scale. It's one in four deaths. <laughs> there are more people who are dying from environmental pollution than all malnutrition, violence, and communicable disease combined. <laughs> All of those other things, right? When we see malnutrition as a church community, we immediately say, we've got to be involved. This is connected to the gospel. Of course, we're going to be there. When we see violence, same thing. When there's a natural disaster, we show up. But there is a bigger issue that's harming more of God's children, which is our mismanagement of the environment that for whatever reason doesn't always connect as immediately to our, um, our religious values. Now I've seen that change and, and, you know, among, among my students to a person, they make that connection Hmm. and they see, you know what, if I want to help people helping clean up the earth is the first thing that I should do helping reduce my negative impacts and then increase my positive impacts uh, and participation in the ecosystem. When you mentioned scripture, my, my mind went to Football and basketball games where you often see John three sixteen for God so loved the world. And I'm thinking the world obviously means the people too, but yeah, probably the planet. That's right. I mean, you can't, this is a little bit theoretical, but the, the root of the word ecology comes from oikos Greek, mm. which means home. And so like oikos yogurt, it's home style yogurt. But um, what's interesting about that concept of home is it's not just the structure Right. You could think of the world as the structure where things live, but it's also not just the inhabitants who are there. It's both of them together. So it's both the life on this planet, which is the only life we know of. Eight million species, Mm. (laughs) Uh, more than eight billion individual people. Right. That all depending on this closed system, the earth. Um, So taking that home approach all of a sudden the separation that we're sometimes taught between nature and society doesn't make any sense either, right? Like if we want to take care of the economy, well, everything in the economy depends on the environment, right? We want to help people address the mental health crisis or growing rates of, of cancer and heart disease, right? All of those things are associated with loss of connection with nature, exposure to environmental pollution. So I really think that taking a step back and realizing we're talking about our home here, And when you use that word home, it immediately evokes the people that are living there, the things that they're doing. So it's not just we're taking care of polar bears, you know, thousands of miles away, even though that's important. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the air that we're breathing, the food that we're eating, the water that we're drinking, the lives that we can live or not. Right. I have a student, Isabella Arrigo, who did an analysis a few years ago and found that we're losing the average Utah is losing between three and five years off of their healthy life because of exposure to air pollution. And I think each of us could take a moment and reflect what would three to five more years with one of our loved ones mean? Mm. How much would that be worth? Mm. Is that something worth fighting for? Whether that's a grandparent, whether that's an infant, anyone in between, right? Like this is about what we're trying to do here on this planet. This is about our home. Yeah. I want those three to five years. I know that. So, <laughs> so um, the, the church certainly hasn't been inactive or silent on environmental issues. It devotes online attention to earth stewardship. It builds quote green meeting houses or has been, it plants water wise grounds at new temples that they tout. It donated thousands of acres of feet of water to help the great salt Lake. Senior apostle Dallin Oaks has touched on climate change in a, in a sermon and presiding Bishop gave a general conference sermon on better use of planetary resources. So all that to say, it's not like the church has been silent or gone on this. So now how could the top leaders bring that messaging 
more urgency, uh, you know, to the issue. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's so interesting to watch these large systems interact. So the environment, unfortunately, has become such a political issue. And I, I think it's important to remember that hasn't always been the case. Right. Richard Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency Mm -hmm. Um, as recently as John McCain's campaign a few years ago. Climate change was right in the Republican platform. Right. But but we've seen this huge division. And I think for many members and likely leaders of the church, it it becomes intimidating to engage on the issue because there's fear that this is going to be divisive. There's fear that this is going to. Uh, separate people from the institutional church and then by extension, their relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and so I, I understand where that hesitation comes from. How did it happen? How did it become polarized? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's not a single contributor. Uh, There's an interesting book by Ezra Klein, why we're polarized Mm -hmm. that I think is really, really excellent. Maybe Uh, just briefly what, what happened? um, So it used to be that we had friends of all different flavors, (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know, your neighbors, uh, would probably be of different religions, of different races, of different socioeconomic levels, um, certainly different political parties. Right? And when you have friends who are in one of those groups, th- that humanizes it for you. Nowadays, if you look at the data, the internet has allowed us to pick out who we're interacting with in a really targeted way. And we seek out people who are like-minded, right? That's, we usually see that as a really positive thing. Or uh, we're fed like-minded people. We're through, fed, that's through, right. You know, yeah, we're not even choosing mm-hmm. it, right? Yeah. The algorithms mm-hmm. are picking who we're going to interact with, who we're going to date, mm-hmm. <laughs> who, um, what news we're going to see, right? And, and that's a big contributor as we have moved away from the physical world, including interactions with nature in our front yards, right? I want to be really clear. When we talk about the environment or nature, we're not just talking about the national parks. This is everywhere that we live, right? There's a whole branch of ecology that's just studying food webs inside people's houses, Mm. you know, crumbs and skin cells and all these, there's a whole biodiversity around us, right? So as we've gotten disconnected from that, that physical, uh, natural world around us, add in the internet stuff um, and add in kind of chaotic individuals and world events, then you can get into a bad place really quickly. But the, none of this is to excuse, right, that that we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints should be leading out on this. I, uh, Bishop um, Cosse's talk was really clear, right? This it, It's essential to our discipleship. This isn't just something that we can do in our free time. If we're serious about being followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be thinking about and acting on this issue. Right. It's faith and works. So I, we're describing kind of how this has ended up getting polarized and is partisan. But we I, I think that we need to be thinking about how do we bridge that? How is do we that how it could be framed? Step? Is that how it could be framed so that perhaps older Latter-day Saints or, or Latter-day Saints a little wary of this could get on board? I don't think there's a single message that's mm. going to get everybody on board. And I think what's so valuable, um, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who's coming in tomorrow, actually, to um, to speak at the Conservative Climate Caucus. So Representative John Stewart's organized this event. He's created a caucus on Capitol Hill that in just a few years has grown to be the second largest caucus in in Washington. John Curtis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So Catherine Hayhoe is the lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy and uh, very um, well-known and accomplished climate scientist. She talks about how we need leaders from every community to be stepping forward. So so, um, somebody who is um, an atheist humanist might not be interested at all in what I have to say, right? I'm I'm a member of the church and a professor at a religious university, right? But they might really listen to Bill McKibben um, uh, or Greta Thunberg, right? So the, we, from each community, we need leaders to step forward and the messaging is going to be different, right? If we're thinking about from a conservative community, we care a lot about food security, about national security, uh, about water. Those things are central to restoring Earth's climate and managing uh, and protecting ecosystems, right? So there's a point of entry for every group because we all depend on the same resources, but there's not a single voice or a single message that I think is going to resonate with everyone. So at BYU, do you avoid the term climate change, use earth stewardship or something (laughs) to, 
to get around the fact that that climate change seems to have become politicized? You know, I, um, I don't avoid that term, right? Again, from in the scientific literature, it's so important that students know what that is describing. And so earth stewardship is not the same as climate change. Um, and it's interesting to see for a lot of people, climate change has come to represent all environmental issues. And I always point out climate change is one of four main environmental issues that I'm really concerned about. Now, it's it's super important, but it's not the only issue. So I don't avoid specific terms. I also I understand some people have been have found that it is really helpful. So um, Becky Edwards has this story. I don't know if you've heard it, but she got a, one of the first bills in Utah, maybe the first that recognized anthropogenic climate change. Um, it was a resolution, not a bill. But she got this passed by simply changing the term climate change to a changing climate. And so it didn't ring that, you know, people's defenses didn't come up so much. I have not had that experience. And it's much more about context and messenger, right? So somebody could use exactly the same term. But if it's someone that you trust and that you believe is credible, then you're going to engage and think about that. So, I, again, I... Um, I don't shy away from any of these issues. I also find that students, young people in general, are hungry to understand the controversy. And so if you're not using the term, um, then you're going to have to dance around and explain what's actually going on. But they want to know why have um, so many people, actually many fewer than you'd think, right? It's less than a quarter of Americans who are dismissive of the risk of climate change. So it's, it's a, it's a very small minority and that has rapidly been shrinking. If you look at um, millennials or younger, there's almost no partisan divide in belief in climate change and, and desire to fix it. So along that line, have you seen a rising enthusiasm for these issues among your students? <laughs> You know, just a few years ago, we created this climate change course at, at BYU, and it grew from a few dozen students to now the enrollment maxes out within a few hours after it opens. And so certainly on that topic, and some of that might just be students are aware the course exists now, you know, but think, I've, I've been at BYU since 2017, and I have definitely seen an increase in um, interest and creativity and resources going toward uh, these issues. Which of, for lack of a better word, climate change issues do they seem most concerned about with, within that area? You know, um, there is a lot of anxiety among young people about what the future is going to look like. And um, I don't want to say many, but some have even resigned themselves to a situation of it's, it's ruined, right? It's been spoiled and there's not much that we can do. Um, there's, there's some very few who are, so that's kind of a despondency place on one extreme. On the other extreme, there still are some who are in denial, you know, who feel like God wouldn't let this happen, wouldn't let this get that bad, right? And what's interesting to me about both of those extremes is they lead to the same personal conclusion, which is there's nothing I can do about it. Mm. It's either too far gone or it's not even a problem. So it doesn't touch on my morals, my actions. And um, I'm much more interested in this space in between. Look, no one knows if we're going to be able to turn around um, climate change. No one. Um, but there were people that said we never could stop the increase in emissions. And guess what? 2024 is likely the turning point. We likely will. So 2023 had the same emissions as 2022. 2024 is likely going to have less emissions than, um, than the year before. So we're at the beginning of this turn at the same time that the economy and the population continue to grow. So the, again, it gets back to this idea of faith and works. Like I'm going to believe that there is something helpful to be done. And that has been reinforced by, you know, my, my work as a global ecologist, but even just as a starting point, no matter what the current studies say, I am going to choose to believe that I can make a difference. And I have found so much power in that position and community and what it, I, I have felt despondency about many issues. Um, and when I start to act, when I start to connect in the real world, the, the feeling changes. I believe that's the spirit working on me individually and, and the whole community. Right. Um, but, but whatever you want to call it rather than doom scrolling and making angry comments, let's all think about what can I, what can I do to help in a little or a big way? So speaking of that, uh, Dave laid out uh, a number of things the church has done at a macro level. Have you been involved in any of that? Uh, have you uh, 
if so, what ones, what, which of the things they're doing are you most excited about? Yeah. The, um, uh, the church draws on experts from all kinds of fields all the time um, to get, you know, external input on what best could be done. Um, I'm familiar with, you know, last year, uh, Bishop Waddell, one of the presiding bishops, gave a talk at the Stegner Symposium at the University of Utah that laid out a really thoughtful um, discussion of water use and the church's role in the 19th century of encouraging members to use more water, right? Mm -hmm. And their recognition now that they have a special role to play as a leader in giving their own water to Great Salt Lake to solve what I view as the most critical local environmental issue, um, restoring Great Salt Lake, uh, but then also inviting every single member to start talking with their leaders and saying, hey, could we change our landscaping or could we fix these sprinklers or we, could we um, have a workshop on learning how to conserve water? Uh, so that's a really encouraging model. It's some top-down leadership, right? It comes from um, uh, the institutional church, but it's also leveraging the fact that you have millions of members around the world, each of whom are going to be seeing things on the local scale that leadership never is going to know about, right? And um, then I know that there also are... Uh, Plans, you know, last year, the church's sustainability director, Jenica Sedgwick, talked about the priorities that the church has that include things like shifting to clean energy, um, uh, supporting healthy communities and um, broader environmental goals that I uh, that are, I assume, in the process of being institutionalized and put into place. I mean, they've talked about big things on the big macro level, yeah. but small things that seem small, at least like changing sacrament cups, Yeah, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, so if the church were to go all in, whatever that might be yeah. on earth stewardship, or as you say, also climate change, um, would the programs, how, how, how did, how did those programs touch regular members? Yeah. You know what I mean? How could it work? Yeah. That's yeah, it's so it's so interesting because I see two categories of action. One of them is what is the church doing as an organization, as a multinational organization? They own a lot of buildings, mm -hmm. vehicles, um, properties. That's all internal. And honestly, I don't think that that connects as much with individual members. Right? I have no say sure, sure. <laughs> uh, in in how those things are managed, but they still are important. Right? And again, it's it's a large organization, and so those things are kind of internal. Then there are a lot of things you mentioned sacrament cups. We did a, um, an audit, a waste audit of, of the church sacrament cups. You're not even going to be able to see them. They're so tiny, the amount of waste that's produced. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, symbolically, they're really important because it's something that each member actually touches each week, uh, getting deeper. I mean, it's representative of the atoning sacrifice of our savior, right? So there, there are actually some really interesting, um, uh, symbolism there. Are we bringing reverence and true principles to what we call the most sacred ordinance that we're doing in our weekly uh, worship? Right. Um, so there are things that are important. I'm going to re revise. There are three categories, actually. Number one is what the church is doing institutionally, internally. Number two is the symbols that we're using. What are we teaching members by example? Uh, and this could, some of that comes from the church. Some of this comes from individuals. Peggy, I loved in your article, um, Jared Meek, right. Who basically created a calling as a sustainability advisor within his ward. He of course couldn't do that on his own, but he approached leadership and said, Hey, I think that, I think we could do better. Um, we had a conversation when I was, when I lived in Orem, um, we realized that I was in the elders quorum presidency. We realized that like half of our budget was going towards disposable plates. And, and cups is like, Hey, we could have better activities if we used, there already are physical plates in every church building, right? Let's use those. And then we can have it be part of the activity to wash them afterwards. So again, in the grand scheme of things, not going to turn the tide of climate change or loss of biodiversity or human pollution, but it starts people thinking in a way that they weren't before. And certainly we believe that's what the church community is for. So we come away from a meeting or an activity with a different view of the world. Right. Um, and then the third area is things that members are going to do on their own in their communities that might not have anything to do with the church. Right. So let's say that we switch to um, that. The church switches to electric vehicles for all of their fleet vehicles. 
that's going to expose members to more electric vehicles. They realize, oh, these actually really nice. <laughs> They're cheaper mm-hmm. to operate, uh, quiet, don't produce local pollution, that, tons of advantages right now that they, that they may not be exposed to. They then might go to choose, make, a, make a change in how they're getting around in their transportation, but those kind of knock on um, effects that happen beyond. So uh, just put your profit hat on for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> like if you, if you could create a program, a, a global program at the local, but at the local level, mm-hmm. like food storage yeah, or um, just uh, <laughs> tell me some of the things you would think of that the locals in that middle category, yeah. the Jared mm-hmm. Meek category, mm-hmm. not self, uh, not individuals coming up with this idea, but the church saying, okay, we want every ward in the church to do X, yeah. but you have to figure it out. The execution of that would be local, you know, regional yeah. and local, because obviously uh, environmental issues in New York city are different than Orem That's or different right. than, yeah. you know, Kinshasa or whatever. Yeah. What what kinds of general things would you like to see programmatically? Yeah, you know, I th- I really do think that having somebody in the ward who is responsible for that is is one of the first steps. You know, who can start asking like a sustainability calling. That's for right every for ward. every ward. Yeah. yeah, and then on on top of that, um, you know, when we look at presidencies in the Relief Society, in the Bishopric, in the Elders Quorum. Uh, there are different responsibilities for the president and for their two advisors. Right. And so it'd be really interesting to say, okay, in every presidency, sustainability is under the purview of one of the advisors or the president. You know, the same way that we say youth involvement is under the first counselor's uh, responsibility. So just making sure that it's really explicit. And the, and the reason for this is there still are many, many good, wonderful members of the church who believe that environment, environmentalism are bad words. And so my students tell me all the time, so our program is called Environmental Science and Sustainability. And they tell me all the time, hey, I was, I told my grandma what I was going to major in. Uh-oh. And, <laughs> and she told me, oh, well, don't get too far into that. You know, and it's like, can you imagine if you told, told her, I'm going into accounting and she's like, oh, well, careful. Just, you just know. Don't add all don't the numbers, know. you know, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, no, this is a, but I say that not to to laugh at anyone, but to recognize there still is cultural um, fear around this issue and having it as an explicit priority in the handbook, having someone who's responsible for this takes all of that away. You know, I know that many of your um, listeners will have brought up things in their wards and they might have been rebuffed and told, no, this is how we do it. Right. Even if that's not the way we have to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no, no requirement that says use disposable plates. Goodness, the church is invested in reusable plates and forks and cups in every building. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but there, there's this unwritten order of things. And if, you know, for better and for worse, we often do view things hierarchically in the church. The for better part of that is we sometimes respond effectively to guidance from the leaders, especially general authorities. The for worse part of that is sometimes we wait to be ordered to do something. And if somebody that's not a leader says, why don't we try X, Y, Z? We say, oh, well, we'll wait until we don't want to get ahead of leadership on this. Right. And we know from our own doctrine that that is an incorrect view. Right. If we there's a scripture that says if, if we're waiting to be commanded in all things, then we are slothful servants. So we actually have scriptural um a scriptural requirement to, to be thinking about how, now that I know, now that the spirit has told me that this is an important part of my discipleship and our leaders have said that, what can I do proactively, you know, rather than just waiting for a program to be put in place. Now that's another really interesting point, food storage, family home evening, um, the perpetual education fund. Many of these big programs in the church started from everyday members asking questions, innovating and figuring things out. And then the institutional church sees that and then they cross pollinate. Right. And and that's an interesting model as well. Don't get discouraged because you are just working in one little corner of the vineyard. Right. All of these issues are local. And just as you said, Peggy, what needs to be done in New York is different than what needs to be done in Salt Lake is different from what needs to be done in Orem and Provo where I live. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to return to uh, just have you drill down a little further on topic that you've already, you've already raised a little bit, but 
do church teachings or possibly Christian teachings about the end times and some members just leave them resigned to the earth's. Yeah. That it's all part of God's plan. It's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I, I, you, you've addressed this a little bit. Is, mm-hmm. is, is that, how, how, how do you counter that? Yeah. You know, um, thankfully it's an, it's a argument that comes up a lot less now than even five or 10 years ago in my experience. Um, but it, but there still are people who say, why should we be so worried about the earth's climate, about other life on earth? Because ultimately the, it's all going to be cleansed and the savior is going to come and then fix everything. Right. And I think that it's actually helpful in a uh, Latter-day Saint community to ask about the body. So we all have a body. We all have a body that's in various states of decay that will eventually die. Do we therefore conclude it doesn't matter how we treat our body? It doesn't matter what we take into our body. It doesn't matter what we put on our body. No, of course. Actually, as a people, I think we've really captured that idea well. We're strict about what we take into our bodies because we believe that our bodies are the temple of God, right? Um, we, we, we treat it with respect no matter what the state of our body is, because it's a reflection of our relationship with God. And it's the same way with the environment, no matter what is going to happen. And this, this, um, reinforces that personal motivation for me. Like I cannot single-handedly reverse climate change or stop a project that wants to build the world's largest artificial islands on Utah Lake, (laughs) but I'm going to do what I can because if I don't engage on this, what does that say about how seriously I've taken God's commandments, right? It's about personal responsibility. And if we're using this bandwagon argument of, oh, well, if China doesn't reduce their emissions, then it doesn't matter what we do. It's like, wait, would we ever use that on any other issue? Oh, if China doesn't stop its human rights abuses, then why should we? <laughs> it's like, wait, no, it's absolutely nonsensical. And it's a sign of, uh, that we haven't thought about that issue deeply. And again, never mock, right? Start from a place of shared values. If, if your uncle uh, brings that up, um, then, then just start asking questions, you know, because I find we never get to that place of, well, there's nothing we can do about an issue we care about. Oh, there's nothing we can do about child trafficking. You know, it's just going on everywhere. There's nothing we can do about malnutrition. It's going to be continuing. No, nobody would, nobody would say that. So one last question. If you had one wish for the church and earth stewardship, what would it be? What's your, what are your final messages to our listeners? You know, I, I believe that religious communities engaging on these environmental issues is the most important thing going on in the environmental movement broadly right now. That's just my personal conviction. And I think it's so important, um, whatever people's uh, faith community, including if, if um, agnostic or atheist, if each of us could ask, what resources do I have? What relationships do I have? And how can I use those resources to help? You know, because it isn't just a few technocrats who are elected officials. It's not just a few people writing reports. We need every job, including stay-at-home parents and children, to be a climate job right now or an environmental job more broadly. If you are an accountant, how can you think about changing the structure of what you're doing in a way that moves us toward a place? Because we're in a race. You know, the, uh, the, the rate of depletion of the Earth system is really, really alarming, right? It, it literally keeps me up at night that those 15 million deaths each year, we don't have months and years and decades to fix these problems. We need to be doing everything that we can to make a better world today because each year that we continue using, for example, fossil fuels that produce almost all of that environmental pollution, that's another 15 million people, right? And each species that we lose, are we going to feel comfortable showing up at the last day telling the Lord, I know that you created desert tortoises, but I really didn't think it was that important. And so we you really take needed that road. We needed that or road, right? That's right. Or the case may be. That's yes. exactly yeah. right. And so um, I don't want us to be starting from a place of fear and loss because I really do believe that this is about creating a beautiful, vibrant, flourishing future that I know is possible, but I also know that's only possible when we work together and religion, civic organizations, um, things that bring us together and make us uncomfortable are a huge part of that, right? Whenever you participate with other people, you're going to be challenged. 
you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be frustrated. And if we can say, look, I'm not going to go back to my basement and write about this online. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to be there next week. Uh, I'm going to help participate in the next activity, not to try to manipulate people, but because I believe in community, because I believe that I have been called to this. That is a place that I think would heal a lot of the individual pain that so many of us are feeling and also make a substantive difference in what's going on in the earth system. Ben Abbott, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to Dave Noyce. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Chris Samuels. We remind our listeners they can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormonland newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up and we'll talk again next time on Mormonland.